is a Pali term, raga, which is usually, usually is translated as passion. And there's its opposite, viraga, dispassion. And there are areas in which raga or passion is a good thing. Passion for the Dharma is a good thing. The desire to practice, the desire to attain the results of the practice. Having a passion for these things is something the Buddha actually encouraged. But otherwise, raga is something you've got to watch out for, a major cause of suffering. And it's an important stage of the practice, an important attainment to be able to develop riraga. First there's dispassion for sensual things, sensual pleasures. Although here it's actually dispassion for your sensual desires. We're more in love with our sensual desires than we are with, than we are with the actual pleasures. The pleasures come and we're not satisfied, so we want more. And we're obsessed with our desires for these things. You can Elaborate your desires for sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, relationships, whatever. The mind can elaborate on these things for days on end. The actual pleasure comes, and it's not really all that much. And when the Buddha points this fact out, everybody says, oh, you're just bad-mouthing the pleasure. But when you look at it, there's really not that much there. And John Lee's images of a dog chewing on a bone and just getting nothing but its saliva, and it's just obsessed with its saliva, drinking down the saliva because you don't get anything from the bone at all. And then there's dispassion for form and dispassion for formlessness. In other words, once you've mastered Jhana, then you develop this passion for it. It sounds kind of sad, doesn't it? You master it, and then you're no longer obsessed with it. And people don't like to hear them or think about the implications of dispassion. It sounds like we're trying to become numb, indifferent, without energy, as if passion were the only energy that we could have to keep us going. Well, in some ways, yes, it is. The fact that we keep going after these things, that energy is something we've encouraged. Society encourages it. And we don't like to think that it was misguided. And so to, we tend to paint a picture that this passion must be some horrible gray state. But as the Buddha said, this passion leads to the ultimate happiness. the ultimate clarity of mind, the ultimate unconditioned happiness, where you don't have to keep creating things, you don't have to keep salivating all the time. You've actually got something that's really fulfilling. But to get there it requires that you abandon your taste for all the other things that get in the way. Most of us practice with the idea that we'd like to collect this and collect that. We'd like to have our cake and eat it too, and have a few more cakes ready to consume. But the extent to which we keep pursuing other things gets in the way of our pursuit of true happiness. You've got to look at it that way. And the passion that keeps us creating these other forms of pleasure which then let us down. You've really got to see that fact, that it's not all that fulfilling. That requires a real shift in our orientation, because we do identify ourselves around the pleasures that we get. Pleasure for sensuality. 
You identify yourself as a person who likes this particular sensual pleasure, that particular sensual pleasure, sexual orientation, this type of food, that type of music. A huge amount of our identity is, is centered there. And it's difficult to step back and look at our identity, because we feel that if we don't have that identity, we're nothing. Regardless of how much the Buddha says, it's to let go of that particular identity is no great loss. And it goes even deeper to our ideas. It's interesting that in the pattern of the different levels of passion that get abandoned, sensual passion goes first, and then it's passion for form and formlessness, which can include not only the states of jhana, but also abstract ideas. He's asking us to step back from our identification with those as well. That's scary, too. I feel that if we abandon our ideals, we're betraying them. Or if we abandon passion for them, we're betraying them. But it's still possible to act on compassion. It's still possible to act on empathetic joy without passion. You have these motivations because they're the right thing to do. You have compassion. And this is where English plays a trick on us. Compassion means you feel the same thing or you feel with somebody else. When somebody is suffering, compassion usually is a painful emotion. You feel part of their pain as well. And for most of us, we live in a state of obsession with other pleasures, so only if we feel somebody else's pain will we turn from our pleasures and focus on helping them. But a mind that's free from passion doesn't need that pain. In order to be helpful, some of you see that there's suffering and you want to help. That's it. You don't have to feel pain along with the people. You just see it's the right thing to do. The Buddha calls it an ornament of the mind. An ornament of the mind that's become cleansed of its passions. It's just not to be you become hard-hearted or unfeeling. It's simply that you don't need the same play of emotions, the same play of feelings in order to get yourself to do the right thing. As I said, when most people are passionate, it's passionate for a particular pleasure. And the only thing that will peel them away from this to notice other people is that pang that comes when you see that they're suffering and hits you, that disturbs your pleasure. So you've got to do something to work on that in order to get back to your equilibrium or get back to the pleasure that you're fascinated with. That's normal motivation. So we hear of another kind of motivation, the motivation of an enlightened mind. It seems strange and alien. But as the Buddha said, it's the most effective kind of compassion there is, where your mind is not pained. So you're not trying to work off your pain. You're helping someone else. In other words, you don't get involved. Ananda made the observation one time. He was talking to Venerable Sariputta. Sariputta had been commenting how he'd reflected one day in his meditation, is there anybody whose death would affect his state of mind? And he realized there was nobody. And then he said, well, what about the Buddha? You wouldn't get disturbed if the Buddha passed away? And Sariputta would say, well, I'd reflect that it's a sad thing that such a beneficial being has to pass, but these everybody has to pass. And Ananda made an interesting comment. It's because of your lack of conceit that you would not grieve over that, the loss of the Buddha. And so for a lot of our compassion is tied up in conceit. There has to be a feeling of pain, and who knows what else has to be done. Your sense of self gets involved in one way or another. 
in order to act in a compassionate way, in a helpful way. And we're so used to it that we don't notice it. And we also don't like the idea, another reason why we don't notice it. But it's there. And it's good to recognize that and good to realize that it would be good, beneficial for everybody involved if you could still be compassionate without that conceit. Where compassion is an ornament of the mind. So thinking in these ways is one way of helping you to realize that some of the qualities we see as good in ourselves are not totally good. They would be admixture of passion. It actually creates problems. And we're so used to having passion mixed up with everything good in our lives that we feel that a state of dispassion would strip the mind of its goodness. So it's good to stop and think sometimes, actively use your imagination to think in these other terms. Because the good done by a mind that doesn't need conceit in order to do that good. There's a lot of genuine goodness there. The compassion that comes from a mind that has found true happiness, total happiness, a happiness inside that doesn't have to depend on conditions, is a very different kind of compassion than the kind of compassion that requires conceit. So try to stretch your imagination every now and then. Look at the ways in which you feed on things to find your happiness. And learn to look at their drawbacks so that the possibility of a happiness that doesn't need to feed becomes more and more attractive, it gives more and more motivation to the practice. so that someday you will know what it's like to find the happiness that comes with dispassion. Because you've opened your mind to the fact that it could be a good thing. <laughs>